Chuck, we're all here. I think we're ready. Where is Andrew? I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Hey, Andrew. Chuck, how are you, man? Good to see you. You look great. You look like you like like you got younger. <laughs> <laughs> what no, you're missing all the gray hair that didn't exist when you saw me last time. <laughs> no, no, it's a good camera angle. Keep staring oh. at the camera. Yeah. Well, hope uh, you, Evelyn, and the kids are all staying safe in the lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Things are good. Uh, you know, relatively speaking, the kids are happy and healthy. Uh, no, Evelyn and I are still married. <laughs> <laughs> and now she can't escape me. <laughs> well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're extremely busy. Uh, so, and you have no idea how excited everyone is here at Kansas family to finally get to meet you um, in person over Zoom. Um, so, so today we have over 800 registered uh, attendees, um, uh, including Kenzie students, staff, uh, prospective students, and also friends of the community uh, from all over the country. So I, I don't know what to say, Andrew, you're kind of a popular dude around here. Uh, oh, appreciate uh, everyone being here and the work that Kenzie Academy does. I don't know if you all know, but uh, Chuck and I are uh, friends from years ago, uh, and he supported me before anyone else did. And I've been trying to help Kenzie Academy in any way I can because I'm very passionate about the work they're doing. Uh, it's exactly what we need more of. Uh, so yeah, like uh, I'm excited to be here. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so Andrew, I'm gonna give a quick uh, intro uh, about Kenzie uh, to especially some of the prospective students that are joining. And then uh, we'd love to then hand over uh, to, to, to uh, have you kind of uh, address everyone. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chuck, the co-founder and CEO of Kenzie, and you are moderator in our Yang Talk today. Um, so uh, for those of you new to Kenzie, we, we are a tech academy that is working to rescue thousands of Americans displaced by automation uh, and this new COVID crisis into the future of work through our online and live training. Um, and today, we, um, I think, uh, Andrew, a quick update on our students. Uh, we have students all around the country, not just in Indiana now. Um, and we also have cohorts uh, 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 of our Amazon Fulfillment Centers. So, you know, thank you for those who are being on the front lines, uh, delivering our packages and during their free time attending Kenzie to retrain themselves. Um, and we also have our sister cohort uh, from Brazil as well. Uh, and over 70% of our students uh, uh, typically, you know, uh, before they join Kenzie, make less than $30,000 a year. And our graduates are graduating into tech jobs that typically make about fifty dollars to $80,000 a year working for companies like Ford Mobility, Angie's List, DMI, Salesforce, and a few dozen other companies. Um, and about 57% of our students are people of color. Um, about 40% are female or self-identified as other gender. So in terms of diversity, um, you know, Kenzie hopefully represents the future of the tech industry. Um, and and uh, Andrew, every month we host kind of a Kenzie AMA with established leaders in tech, politics, or nonprofits, people, uh, uh, um, they've been very successful in their field. And the goal is to expose our students to new thinking and kind of different points of view, uh, in addition to their tech training, and allow them to network with all these leaders so that our Kenzie alumni grow up to be better leaders in their companies and communities. So um, speaking about growing up, uh, when I was building Kenzie, I decided to uh, build a board of advisors of people that I aspire to be when I grow up. And Andrew, uh, who is uh, someone who's created a lot of jobs in the Midwest uh, through his Venture for America organization was someone I highly looked up to. And my daughter, Elena, was also a, a, a big fan and was really inspired after reading Andrew's book on uh, smart people should build things. So if you guys have not read that book, that is a very good book to get. Um, and um, Andrew, we're very lucky to have you as an advisor. Um, uh, uh, really fortunate that you believe in our mission and help us uh, a lot during our early days of Kenzie. Uh, when I first met Andrew, he had just stepped down from Venture for America, and he told me he was working on a new project. So as a curious engineer, I, I asked Andrew, you know, what, what is the project? And um, he, he told me that he's been fighting the war with robots for quite some time through his, you know, leaking top analogy that many of you have heard before. But no matter how hard he tried to fill water on the top, water was leaking out at a much faster pace at the bottom. So the only way to really solve that was to truly disrupt the system. Um, so Andrew is absolutely right in terms of the problem that's impacting America uh, uh, for the last few years, but also going forward. Um, but sadly, many leaders uh, were still fighting the same issues and talking about the same issues as they did 30 years ago. 
And not too many people really had the courage to confront the core problems head on that led to so much anger and hope, loss of hope, uh, especially in the Rust Belt states. So, you know, that, that, that was what motivated me and my co-founders to start Kenzie. Uh, but while we chose to start a school, Andrew chose to run for president instead. Um, so, of course, you know, uh, initially when Andrew told me about the project, um, I, I was a little skeptical. Uh, but don't get me wrong, it's, I have no doubts about Andrew's ability. Uh, he's an extremely charismatic person. But what I felt that convincing the country by actually telling them the truth, that sounds almost Terminator futuristic, felt like a mission impossible. But Andrew, knowing Andrew, he went on to start a movement. And regardless of your personal politics, it's amazing to see how much you know, one single person could accomplish to change the narrative of an entire nation. Um, today, if you look at the news, if you talk to people, it is widely acknowledged that automation uh, is one of the root causes of you know, so much disruption in American jobs. Uh, and during this crisis, uh, you know, an MIT professor has uh, termed this as the automation forcing event. Uh, we pretty much uh, see how, how everything is happening in, in a fast forward basis. Um, and um, never have I thought that uh, uh, you know, so quickly the government would implement some form of the universal basic income. Um, so um, Andrew, excited for you to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure now to hand it over to you uh, to, talk, to tell us about your view of what the future holds for America. Well, thank, thank you, Chuck. Um, what's funny is when he said he was skeptical when I told him I was going to run for president, um, he, he had a good poker face. He didn't express that to me at the time. <laughs> Uh, he was like, yes, let's do it. Uh, I'm on board and support it. <laughs> uh, so uh, grateful to Chuck for co-founding Kenzie Academy because I do think this is exactly what both people need, the country needs, the economy needs. We need to give people the ability to make career transitions more effectively, particularly when it comes to gaining new skills for uh, the tech industry in particular. So I'm, again, very, very grateful uh, to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. And um, I'll talk about myself first, and then the economy, and then I'll take some questions. Um, so the, the thing I would try to do for people who are in the development phase of their careers professionally is to try and demystify how the heck uh, I got to you know, be the person who's like, um, like speaking to you as opposed to the other way around. <laughs> let's, put that, let's put it that way. Uh, and it, there's really no, um, no uh, like magic to it where I can very vividly remember being in your shoes, uh, a student trying to figure out what the next steps were for me professionally. And for me, it was a bit of a mess, honestly. Like uh, I graduated from college and I went to law school um, which I don't recommend. Uh, and I was an unhappy lawyer for five whole months. Uh, and you know what doesn't happen when you decide to quit being a lawyer? They don't give you a refund for the law school <laughs> tuition or the loans. It's like, so I was walking around with six figures in school loans for years. I used to call it my mistress because I felt like I was supporting a family in another town. I was like, I hope they're enjoying uh, themselves in uh, you know, town Sally May, because uh, I was sending over a thousand bucks a month um, to school loan payments for a degree that I was no longer using uh, because I set out on my own to try and do something like Chuck uh, has done, which is start a business. And then I found starting a business was incredibly difficult where I started a company that flopped. Um, and then I joined another company that ran out of money. And then I joined another company that didn't really accomplish its goals. And I, I pretty much just summarized my 20s, <laughs> more or less. I, you know, I was uh, trying to make myself a um, uh, contributor to a winning team, um, and it wasn't really happening for me. Uh, and in my case, I got very lucky where someone came to me and said, hey, I'm starting a tutoring company. Do you want to be a tutor and help me out? Um, and I said yes, in part because like I was frankly like at, at um, a bit of a, a career loss and I thought well like at a minimum I'll have this to fall back on and moonlight and make some extra money and then that tutoring opportunity ended up morphing into over time or evolving into my becoming CEO of the company 
after five, six years of being an instructor. And so I became CEO of that company. And then that company then grew and became quite successful. Uh, so that's just to let you all know that there isn't like a straight line path that it's not like, oh, if I do this, 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 then like everything will work out and that like uh, um, people like Chuck or myself. I'm sure Chuck has his share of war stories to tell you. Uh, and that if you were to rewind the tape at uh, to any point in his, you know, <laughs> like his formative stages, he would be very similar to, to, uh, to you all in terms of trying to uh, figure out next steps. I was at the very same point um, in my 20s. Um, and I got very lucky that really the head of that education company wanted to leave to start a charter school for underprivileged kids. Like if he didn't have that altruistic impulse, then he never would have needed a uh, CEO of the company. Uh, and then I became CEO of that company and ran it for six years. So I, I know very, very acutely that I've had a lot of uh, good mentorship and good luck in my career. Um, and that it's, it, there is like a real period of figuring it out. And so if you feel like you're a little bit, you know, adrift or trying to figure out what the paths are, just know that that's just the norm for everyone. That's the norm for uh, everyone at different points in their careers. So what happened in, in my case was I became head of that company, ran it for a number of years, and then the company was bought by a bigger company in uh, 2009. Uh, and so I then said, well, great, I'm gonna work for this big company um, and enjoy myself. And it turns out I did not enjoy it. Uh, like it was wild where as soon as I stopped being CEO of that company and became uh, an employee of the big company, like personally for me, I struggled. And so I left, and this is where it gets a little bit wild in terms of my career trajectory. I left to start a nonprofit that Chuck mentioned, uh, Venture for America. And I joke all the time with my wife that there was like this bait and switch because when she met me, I was like a fairly normal executive at this education company and like had a normal life and schedule. And then when I started this nonprofit with a goal of creating thousands of jobs around the country, all of a sudden I was, uh, you know, traveling all the time and like constantly trying to raise money for this feel good organization that helped create hundreds, even thousands of jobs in uh, 15 cities around the country. And I did that for six years and seven, six and a half years. And then, uh, Chuck and I met around that time because I'd realized that I wasn't going to be able to create enough jobs to actually put the country on the right path. So most of you probably know this uh, next part is I then decided to run for president. Uh, and so I started running for president. Uh, technically, I filed the paperwork in 2017. And this is a, a little known fact, but um, it's essentially free to file the paperwork to run for president. So all of you can do it. So that means you, Amanda Key, uh, Jackson Detke, Stephen Carrington, Tristan Reeves, Nicole Roberts, Natalie Hassan. Like, if you go to the FEC, you too can run for president, <laughs> essentially. And if you look, hundreds of people do it every four years. But then after you follow that paperwork, uh, then the hard part begins, which is then you have to try and raise money and get press and like get people to take you seriously. So that's when uh, I was introducing Chuck to this idea, and he was probably right to be skeptical. Um, but I was running on a set of ideas that are very important for you all and for the, this conversation, um, which is that our economy is transforming around us. And as Chuck said, the coronavirus is accelerating those changes, where uh, the things I was concerned about were that the five most common job types in the United States uh, were all getting automated away. Uh, and those five job types are administrative and clerical work, retail, food service and food preparation, truck driving and transportation, and manufacturing. Now, uh, let's try, I'll do a little Q&A just for fun. Like what percentage of American jobs do you think fall into those five categories? Which I'll repeat again. And you go ahead and uh, type it into, is there a chat window? Let's see. Yeah, there's a Q&A. So go ahead and just uh, type in, just it'd be a number, it'd be like a percentage. What percentage of American jobs do you think fall into these five categories? Administrative and clerical, retail and sales, food service and food prep, 
truck driving and transportation and uh, manufacturing. Let's see if I can see answers. I'm scrolling down. Let's see what I can find. All right, some people writing in some fun stuff. Um, so Steven Serio said 90%, which is uh, high. Uh, it's about half, 60 to 80% is what Joshua Gossin said. Um, so it's about half, it's like 49% uh, of jobs fall into those five categories. And the, the one that I thought catalyzed Trump's victory, I did anchor you very high. So if you went high, that's a very reasonable thing to do because I made it seem like it was gonna be some dramatic reveal. It's like, ah, like 99%, no. So it's four, it's 50% of the jobs or so, 49%. Uh, and the, the thing I thought, thought catalyzed Trump's victory in 2016 was that we'd already automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs that were primarily based in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa. Um, and now the other four sectors were automating progressively. Retail and sales being the most dramatic. And the coronavirus crisis, we'll talk about retail because it's the most relevant. So uh, being a retail clerk's most common job in the US economy, and I was concerned that we were going to close 50% of malls in the next four years. Uh, and that was going to displace hundreds of thousands of workers. Now, you all know we've closed many more than half of the malls um, during this crisis. Uh, and now some of them are reopening. But the reality is uh, brick and mortar retail is going to shrink dramatically. And you don't necessarily think of that as automation of jobs because it's not like you go to the mall and there's a robot selling you stuff. Um, but if you look into Amazon's fulfillment centers, it's wall-to-wall -wall robots. Sounds like some of you might work for Amazon or want to work for Amazon. Uh, it's wall-to-wall -wall fulfillment centers and it's Amazon that is making that mall shut down or the JCPenney or the Macy's or, or, or what have you. So the coronavirus crisis is unfortunately compressing the time frame, where if I said, hey, half of malls are gonna close in the next five years, it's probably more like five weeks or five months, um, where I've been saying that, 10, that we're gonna experience 10 years worth of change in 10 weeks because of the coronavirus crisis. And many companies right now are investing at higher levels in technologies that will automate jobs away. Uh, because, and an example I use that we can all understand, um, at this point, if the Domino's pizza gets delivered to you in a self-driving car, uh, that's actually value add for you because you're like, cool, like fewer humans touch this thing and I don't have time to interact with a human. I can just go out and hit, hit the code into the, um, the pizza car and then it just like pops out. Um, so that, that's not, no longer neutral, that's actually positive because you'll feel like, oh good, fewer humans means lower rate of infection. Um, so that's happening in industries around the country right now. Uh, and what we need to do is have this dramatic uh, nationwide rebuilding effort that includes training and reskilling people uh, for jobs that are going to be here for years to come. Uh, that's one reason why I love what Kenzie's doing so much. So I, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the other trends in the economy because I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, it, it's really important. Uh, so the jobs you all are training to do, uh, everyone needs someone who can help uh, build, manage, uh, and uh, in some cases maintain these technologies uh, where what's, what's happening increasingly is that you're having companies uh, lighten their footprints in terms of office space and uh, headcount, um, but they need the right people with the kind of skills that they can use remotely. Uh, and so there's going to be a massive need for people with technical skills as there has been for the last number of years. Um, but that need is going to only grow in the, in the days ahead. Uh, and for people who don't have the kind of skills that they can project digitally or remotely, it's going to get harder and harder uh, because the folks who require being in person with you, let's call them uh, personal trainers, yoga teachers, uh, you know, stylists, nail salon, uh, you know, it, it's gonna get harder and harder. Uh, 
and it breaks my heart honestly because obviously like it's no one's fault uh you know and, and this is one reason why i ran for president where like for whatever reason we've been misled or like just duped into thinking that if we all just keep on heading on the same path then uh the market will figure it all out for us um and i from my work at venture of america i knew that just wasn't true uh and so we're going to have to do things differently um hey chalk maybe you can answer this too it's like i get the sense like have you guys gotten any public support or is it purely um is, is it purely just uh like enterprise like you guys because it wouldn't surprise me if it was just enterprise but like have you gotten any government support uh, very little at this stage. Um, so, you know, a Title IV institutions definitely has all the support they need. So it's definitely an unfair battleground. Yeah, so, uh, and this is something that happened to me with Venture for America, where we did end up getting a grant from the state of Ohio, but in the first five years, we got minimal government support. Um, the, the politicians would show up to events and make a speech, you know. <laughs> There was very little in the way of um, of resources um, for us from from the the public level, uh, and that's the the operational reality uh, for a lot of great things for many of the you know most effective things. Um, one of the my goals is to try and have the two interface. Where to me, the government has to get involved in more of these solutions, even if getting involved means just cutting a check. It's like, uh, you know, just trying to make things easier uh, for folks to be able to identify better pathways. Um, but it doesn't surprise me at all, Chuck, because I had the same experience. Um, and a, a lot of the best uh, work, it gets done just when a group of awesome people come together, as is the case with Kenzie, and say, hey, the world needs this, we can build it. And if we do great work, then uh, we'll end up being able to sustain ourselves and grow. Um, so congrats to, to you and you know, again, it doesn't surprise me that you've done it uh, essentially uh, independently and on your own. Well, Andrew, you did say that when you win the presidency, you allocate billions of dollars to, to help solve this training issue. <laughs> yeah, I did say that and I, and, I mean, because we need to do that. And, um, you know, we may even do that if I, obviously I'm not going to be president <laughs> this time. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's a good chance I'll be working with the administration I just talked to uh, Joe Biden last week. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, various people in the administration. And yeah, so Chuck, I'm still gonna try and make good on that, even if it's not me, um, because what you're doing here is exactly what we should be doing more of all over the country. Uh, and if you do decide to sign up with Kenzie, um, you should know that the team genuinely just wants to make you better, stronger. Like, uh, just trust me when I say that, uh, the folks at Kenzie have the right motivations because I remember talking to Chuck when he was starting this thing and th there were other things that he could have been doing <laughs> that, 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 uh, but he wanted to do this because he sensed that the country needed it um, and so you should know that uh, that this, this organization is like the opposite of one of those organizations where they're like you know just seeing people as um, people to fill seats or like, uh, you know, trying to make a buck like that. That's not really the the motivation of the Kenzie uh, team. Like they're genuinely trying, just trying to make people stronger and solve problems for uh, for everyone, for individuals, for the economy. Um, yeah, so, and and I've, I've run an education company, so I, I know um, I know the difference. <laughs> it's, it's a very big difference. Uh, so that's, a, that's my story and a little bit about what I see coming down the pike. Uh, but we'd love to take questions from people. I always enjoy taking questions. I even kind of miss it since when I was running for president, it would happen to me very, very often. <laughs> always welcome back to Kenzie, Andrew. Uh, we, we, our students have plenty of questions for you. Uh, but since uh, I know a lot of people are trying to ask questions on the chat as well, we do have limited time. So what we did was we have uh, uh, picked a couple of students uh, that had some questions that they submitted in advance. Works for me. That's good preparation. Yep. So uh, let's start with uh, Scott Reese. If you want to unmute your uh, mic um, and tell Andrew where you are and uh, your question. 
Hey, yeah, so I'm Scott Reese. I'm from Indianapolis. I am a software engineer alumni from Kenzie. Uh, so I'm working at EMI. But so straight to the question, so we have limited time. There's there appears to be corruption in our politics, and before any visionary ideas get through, reform has to happen. How do you factor in the political landscape and any perspective strategy you may have in mind for achieving something like uh, UBI? Well, congratulations, Scott. Thanks for the thoughtful question. Um, first, from the, the back end of that, first, I'm optimistic that universal basic income is going to be front and center and pass, maybe even this year. Uh, a survey just came out that said 76% of Americans are in favor of direct cash relief to us uh, during this crisis for the duration. Uh, and we're going to be struggling with job creation for years to come. Um, th this is going to be common sense. Uh, and so I'm optimistic that uh, cash relief to people will happen. Um, you're right that our political system is very corrupt. And so the, the, there is a little bit of like what happens first, like do you somehow get uh, like a different type of leader in office or do you fix the system? And I, I suggest that we have to try and shoot for both of them. So even though I'm known for uh, universal basic income and uh, free money, um, which I'm obviously very happy to be <laughs> known for, um, but there was a, a very large portion of my platform around democracy reform around 100 democracy dollars for every American so that we can fund candidates who represent us. Rank choice voting, uh, we should have had that like a million years ago, like that, that actually would have changed outcomes. Um, the, the, the tough truth is that we have a duopoly right now and it's not serving as well at all. And I went through the democratic process and there were problems <laughs> with the process. I, I mean, you can look back even at like the last race and say, it's like, uh, you know, if you were a Bernie supporter in 2016, which I, I was too, clearly the DNC like kneecapped Bernie. I mean, that's like objective history and truth at this point. Um, and so, uh, you know, like, so there, there are problems, <laughs> there are real problems. Uh, and to me, it's a little bit of like, uh, like you got to try and go down both roads. I am 100% for democracy reform that I think would elevate different types of candidates. Um, but I actually also think that different kind of candidates can run successfully even now. Um, and, and, you know, like it or not, you can actually thank Donald Trump for that. Um, because he was a different kind of candidate. Um, and, you know, my campaign's relative success, I think, demonstrates it too, that things are changing. And the institutions just aren't as uh, powerful as they were. Like, they just don't have as much control as they did. But thank you for the question, Scott. It was very on point. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Jay Thurman. Jay, uh, you going to unmute yourself? Yes. Hi, Mr. Yang. Thank you so much for meeting with us again. My name is Jay. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. And so my question was, what is an actionable set of SMART goals that you believe can be implemented to decrease the incidence of healthcare related disparities? For example, like maternal um, mortality at childbirth, COVID-19, pain management, et cetera, but specifically amongst the black community. Well, thank you for the question, Jay. It's unconscionable what we are seeing around the country in terms of the racial disparities. Uh, and you can see the fatality rate among uh, blacks is much, much higher. I think it was six times higher in one thing I saw. Um, uh, Latinos, it's not that different. Uh, and so what I, what I say to people is that this virus is preying on our pre-existing conditions and massive racial disparities. Uh, it's a pre-existing condition in the United States of America. So when you talk about smart goals, when you're talking about issues that big and pervasive, uh, I think we should have universal health care. I mean, that would be a start. Um, but when you talk about maternal health um, and the fact that you're much more likely to die if you're a, a pregnant black woman and, and going into hospital childbirth from complications than, you, than if you're uh, a white woman, uh, I, I think there are at least like two things you can identify immediately. Uh, number one is that for whatever reason, our healthcare system and our healthcare professionals do not respond to uh, black people and black women um, identifying symptoms in the same way. They just hear it and we're like, yeah, it's, it's no big deal. Um, when uh, it is a big deal in many cases and people die as a result of them just not listening. So that's something that you can try and train for and say, look, FYI. I mean, one way you might be able to train for it is you try and have um, higher representation uh, in your healthcare professions, where it's like if you had a black female doctor and a black wo woman 
comes in and talks about various like discomfort or complications like they probably probably listen listen to them uh, better differently um the second thing of, around the maternal health to me is that like they're just higher stress levels associated with being black in this country and then uh because of that the complications when they come in um are higher like it's just stress is bad for pregnancy so it's bad for pregnant women um, and now that now this is a very far reaching question. It's like, how can you make it less stressful to be black in the United States of America when you have like people killed for running while black? You know, I mean, talk about stressful. It's like, I can't go for a jog without thinking some people are going to like hunt me down and shoot me. I mean, that, that's like, you know, like it, it's uh, catastrophic. So, uh, so that's a very, very tough challenge. Uh, we all know that, like, I think the first step of this challenge is just give people a certain amount of money, which is something that Martin Luther King championed. Um, he was actually fighting for it very hard when he was assassinated. And, uh, the, and the, 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 does giving everyone money somehow uh, erase racial inequities uh, or the stress that I'm describing? No. Um, does it make it marginally better? Yes. And is it something we can actually do like very straightforwardly and politically? Yes. In a way that it's harder so that what you do to me is like you solve the problems in order. And so the, the easiest thing to solve is like, well, shoot, like if you have 78% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck um, and the levels are much, much higher where you have like black families at 10% the average net worth of a white family uh, and their net worth going to zero by like 2050. It's like, well, you change that and like that. And then you start trying to address other racial inequities uh, in everything from the healthcare system to criminal justice, um, but you have to tackle first things first. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, definitely was watching the news, uh, you know, really breaks my heart seeing that. And my daughters ask me, you know, why, you know, how do I explain that um, to kids? Um, but uh, uh, next question is with, uh, uh, from uh, student uh, Drew Sexton. Drew, uh, unmute your microphone. Hi, Mr. Yang. Thank you so much for taking some time out from your very busy schedule to speak with us. We very much appreciate it. Uh, my question kind of builds on, on Jay's point that she made. Um, how do you see the role of technology and specifically software engineers in improving the lives of historically underrepresented and underserved communities? And also, what other infrastructure would need to be in place in order for those benefits to be fully realized? Well, thank you for the question, Jim. Thank you for the support. I love the math hat. That makes me feel good. Um, yeah, so uh, like Chuck talked about it at the opening where um, number one is if you have diverse people in software uh, fields, like that's a freaking huge step up, you know, because we all know these jobs pay better um, and uh, lead to different types of career opportunities. So if you can, so Drew, if you're a software engineer and then there's someone who's uh, trying to break into the field or applying for a job or needs a hand uh, and they're from an underrepresented community, then if you can do something for them directly, like that's very, very helpful and powerful. Uh, number two is trying to solve problems that affect different kinds of people. And the, the brutal truth is that if you just solve market-based problems, they are less likely to touch uh, black communities, communities of color, like communities who are struggling. So one of the organizations I've been working with recently, uh, uh, Propel, they made a, an app for food stamp recipients to be able to like access funds in different ways and more effectively. And then during this crisis, we wound up um, needing them and using them because we were trying to get people money uh, in a, affected areas quickly. And thank goodness they existed <laughs> and, and, and they had done this because, and they were not doing it for um, commercial reasons uh, strictly. I mean, they're, you know, they're a for-profit company, but the leaders were just like, hey, we should try and do something to solve different kinds of problems. So if you're a software engineer and you can try and broaden the kinds of problems you're working on, that's enormous. Um, and you should know that the problems you're going to be naturally driven towards are not those kinds of problems because the market will continuously be like, hey, solve this, um, this financial uh, services problem for not, not you know, poor people, but, 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 but for some like, uh, you know, rich company that wants to like operate like slightly more efficiently. So it, so it takes uh, some keeping your head up and trying to identify the right kinds of things to work on. But I'm sure you can do it, Drew, uh, because as long as you're driven in that direction, um, you know, you'll be able to find those opportunities. 
Andrew, the next question comes from uh, Ashley McKenzie. Ashley, uh, where are you at? Did you name Hi, good morning. Company? Thanks for... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's what I said. That's how I chose the school. Um, okay. Thanks for meeting with us. My name is Ashley. Um, my question for you is, given the current climate, uh, would you consider running again in the future? And um, how do you see America leaning more on technology moving forward? Um, your law or your um, your background in law and education, I feel like this would be a good question for you because I'm homeschooling my kids right now and I just feel like, ooh, like I, I think that this is probably gonna be like a major next step for schools and that a lot of schools are probably gonna maybe implement programs like this where, where we're homeschooling a lot more and really leaning on technology. Um, what do you think about that? Well, uh, congrats to you for taking care of your kids, uh, Ashley, because we have two kids at home too, and it's so much. Uh, happy Mother's Day. And uh, you're doing at least two jobs if you've got kids at home. Um, and you you. Know, I, I feel like you can say two things about the, the um, homeschool, online schooling. It's like one, we need to, to do more of it and make it better. <clears throat> but two, I think that there are going to be um, many people who also see that there are limitations to it. Uh, so both of those things I believe are true. Um, you know, it's like I, I see my four-year-old and seven-year-old learning every day and uh, I'm very grateful uh, that their teachers are trying to teach them online. Um, and there are things we could do to make it better. I'll tell you from my family what's happening is that um, my, my seven-year-old's on the autism spectrum and he just gets up and walks away from the screen. And then if you're the teacher, what can you do about that? <laughs> you know, not a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> you're just like looking at empty space being like, Christopher, Christopher, can you come back? And like Christopher is like skipping around. And so, so either uh, my wife Evelyn or I have to be like monitoring him. Um, and so in a way you have like two people who are necessary because it's uh, on, you know, because of the delivery mechanism. Um, now, now that said, do I think that more education is going to be delivered online than ever, particularly for adults? Yeah, clearly. Uh, clearly there are many of these schools that are going to um, go out of business because they don't have the right value proposition and it's based on you being physically in a particular environment. Um, so what you're saying is true that we're gonna need much more in terms of online delivery of education and particularly support for parents. Uh, where somehow we have to set parents up in an environment where their kids can learn and a parent can work. And right now, those two things are very hard to come by. I know, I mean, it's going on in my house right now. Yeah. It's very, very hard to work and have kids in your house right now. Um, so we need to try and solve that problem uh, in a much bigger way. Um, using my family as a test case, like I probably should be thinking about it, but like if the seven-year-old just gets up and runs around, <laughs> like, like what is the, you know, what's the tech solution for that? Like uh, we'll have to think about that. Maybe someone here could help figure that out. Um, they actually make those robots, Andrew, in San Jose that actually uh, it's on an iPad, so it follows the people. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I guess my kid definitely uh, needs it. Um, but but you know who I think really needs it too are parents. Like parents like the day just goes by because your kids are just, uh, you know, a buzzsaw that, uh, of that they need uh, both activity and attention. And then you're like, where the heck did the day go? Um, and like, I feel you, like we're in the same boat. Um, so we need to try and solve that problem in a very meaningful way because it's going to be faced by many, many families, not just you, Ashley, that's for sure, or me. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Nelly Hassan. Uh, Nelly, if you can uh, unmute and uh, introduce where, where you're based, what program you're in, and ask your question. Hi. Thank you for being here today, Andrew, first. And um, my name is Natalie. I'm from Western New York. I'm a software engineering major here at Kinsey. Um, my question has to do with the process of opening up the country again. Um, I just want to know your thoughts about it. I've heard you touch on this before, but just... Um, the reopening of the country and its impact on the economy, on public health. Uh, would you implement anything different and any advice for us going through this process under the current plan? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I think that we're in a very tough situation right now because 
the vaccine is months and months away and you have to try and reopen at least parts of your economy during this time frame. So the missing piece for us right now is testing. It's like when you're like, hey, all clear, go back. You're like, based on what information? Like the, the main information that we're getting right now is people showing up in hospitals sick. Uh, and there is a very strong relationship between that number and the number uh, of infections in the population. Um, but you know, it's an even better judge of uh, the infection rates in the population is actually testing people in the population. So we're in a, a tough spot right now because people are making decisions based upon incomplete information at best. Um, and then you have states and leaders saying, okay, we're gonna reopen certain parts of the economy up. And then you have individual actors, whether it's companies or families and individuals saying, okay, my state has now officially reopened its businesses. Does that mean I should go out to the bar right now or to the restaurant? And you're like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> like, don't really think so. Maybe I'll wait a little while. So, uh, so for us as individuals, like we have to make our own determinations based upon, um, you know, like our, our own risk levels, our own risk tolerance levels, like like the importance of whatever it is that uh, we're doing, whether it be for work or or recreation. Um, for government leaders, the big missing piece is tests. Like if I was a governor looking at this, I'd be like, okay, what data am I making this decision based on? Um, and they're making it based upon hospital admissions and not testing at large. Uh, so that that's the part that pains me the most as an American, really. It's like, why the heck do we not have testing? Why are we so behind the curve uh, on things that other countries have been able to deliver on? Now, some of these other countries are much smaller than we are, but that's still not a great excuse. You know, it's like, uh, it, I mean, <laughs> you know, like, like they've, um, like we, we're bigger, um, but in theory, at least, we have much more in the way of resources to help solve these problems. It's just in, in this case, I really do put a lot of this as a failure of leadership. Um, it pains me greatly. It's like, I, I, it's not even that I wish I were president in, in 2021. I wish I had been president uh, while this crisis was building because I genuinely think we would have gotten in front of it sooner. Um, and I, I will say that the big missing piece for us all, Natalie, is just more testing and better info. Thank you, Andrew. The next question is from uh, Mike uh, 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 al um, He's a student of Kenzie that went to visit Jordan and was uh, trapped there for the COVID crisis and attending Kenzie from Jordan. So Mike, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Chuck. And thank you, Mr. Yang, for your time. Uh, I am currently a uh, fourth quarter uh, student in the software engineering track at Kenzie Academy. And the question I have for you today, Mr. Yang, is that you've spoken a lot in the past about how automation is likely to affect blue collared work, specifically truck drivers, manufacturers, service workers, and other jobs throughout the economy. But as someone retraining into software development, I wanted to hear your take on how automation could impact my future career within the same time frame as the one set for blue collared work and what could we do to stave off the impact until a policy like the freedom dividend is enacted thank you mike uh so you're in jordan now is that right yes that's correct mr yang wow um what time is it over there <laughs> it is uh, it's 8 46 p.m that's not so bad it's not like middle of the night action uh, i do talk much more about the blue collar impact um because I thought it'd be easier to understand and there were more jobs involved. Um, but you are 100% right that it's gonna come to white collar jobs and software engineering jobs too, uh, you know? Now, if you're a coder, um, to me, even if you end up uh, automating away coding work in one setting, like there'll be another setting that they still need you uh, uh, in. So like you are among the less vulnerable uh, for sure you know because like if, if you are a good coder uh there'll always be someone who like needs you to to uh do work during like the next you know number of years uh and when you talk about trying to stab it off um one of the so i'll tell you guys a joke i told on the trail that happens to be true i said the the technology and artificial intelligence are getting stronger and faster all the time and for the most part we human beings are not 
uh, and that when you become an adult, uh, you feel grateful if you didn't get dumber on a given day. Um, where if you could still find your keys, you're like, all right, it's still happening. <laughs> oh my God, it's still working around here. Um, and that always got a laugh. Um, but you know, it, it's, if you're looking at stabbing it off, the best thing you can really do is invest in yourself, uh, just to try and make yourself, um, valuable in different ways. And certainly your technical skills is like number one. Um, but there are other things too, uh, where, you know, investing in, relationships is positive or in, in, investing in your own um, uh, intellectual breadth, uh, I would say. Um, so there are different ways to try and make yourself automation proof. Um, in terms of us collectively slowing the rate of automation, uh, as you can tell, like I'm not optimistic that there are realistic things you could do um, with the exception of certain regulatory things in certain industries. Um, but that, those would not apply to a software engineer. It, it would be more like, hey, um, we're going to mandate having a truck driver in the cab, even though the truck can drive itself. Like, like that's a kind of regulatory move that, um, that might be realistic and necessary. Like, I'm not ruling that one out. Um, the best thing you can do, really, Mike, is, is invest in yourself. I would suggest traveling to Jordan. Like, you know, I'm sure you didn't expect to be there that long. But, um, you know, that sounds like, like a pretty good way to broaden one's horizons. Yeah, th thank you very much, Mr. Yang. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I'm going to actually uh, uh, ask one of the questions that was asked on the Q&A um, uh, from Latoya. So Latoya is asking, with the future of brick and mortar businesses looking so bleak, is it worthwhile to develop tech solutions that would help the small mom and pop companies? Uh, for example, minority family owned businesses that provide uh, local services. Well, thank you for the question, Latoya. Yeah, it is for sure. Uh, you know, I, I, there's always an appetite for uh, local entrepreneurship um, that meets that community need in a way that others do not. And those businesses need help. Um, so even though I agree with you, it's a bleak future for many brick and mortar businesses. There's no reason not to try and invest in helping some of those businesses, particularly if they're of a community, will provide a need for the community that others would not. Uh, I, I believe that there will be um, still opportunities at that level, but they need help. Thank you. Um, uh, Andrew, there's all these rapid fire questions uh, coming your way. Uh, next one is from uh, Sean Parker. Sean, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, where are you at? And go ahead and ask. Hi, Mr. Yang. Thank you for spending time with us today. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm a UX student from Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'd like to know more about UBI. How would you have implemented the program? Um, where would the money come from? And also, would the cost of living go up if every American had a basic level of income? Well, thanks for the question, Sean. Uh, so my plan was to have it be pegged to inflation for your last thing. So if it started at 1,000 and then core inflation was uh, 2%, then you get 1,020 like the, the next year. Um, in terms of where you get the money to pay for it, you get the money from the same place you uh, got the $4 trillion we gave to the Wall Street banks in 2008 or the $1.5 we, we got to give to the big companies in a tax cut uh, two years ago or the $2.8 trillion in counting we just got this COVID relief money for. Uh, like one, one of the things that um, I saw was that we've somehow been brainwashed into thinking we don't have the money to do things. And we 100% have the money. Uh, we're the richest economy in the history of the world, $21 trillion a year before this crisis. I mean, now it's gonna be lower, um, but still 21 trillion bucks a year. Uh, we could afford a dividend of a thousand bucks a month uh, or higher if we managed to harness the gains of the economy to work for us. Uh, and the examples I used on the trail, you have Amazon, paying zero in taxes. Like, you know, I mean, how the heck does that make sense? Netflix, zero. Starbucks, zero. Like if you have some of your biggest, most successful companies um, paying zero in taxes, then it seems awfully hard to pay for things. So back to the first question we got, it's like, is there corruption in the system? Yeah, there's corruption in the system. Uh, but we have the money. And if we put the money into our hands, then it would not disappear. It would create a virtuous circle where it flows into various businesses that then employ more people. We do need to try and make it so we're all participating in the games. And for those of you who are studying at Kenzie or have these uh, software engineering jobs and are alums, uh, you know, like I know you'll feel better about your work if you feel like the value is getting 
distributed in different ways where it's not like oh i win you all lose <laughs> you know it's like you know like we can make it so that we all are able to participate in progress um so so sean those are some of the, the answers to your questions but yeah i'd be pegged to inflation so even if prices went up we just get a bit more um the, the reality is that right now we're in a we're in danger of a deflationary period because of this crisis um, inflation is so not a worry right now. Uh, like, uh, you know, the house is on fire. We just need to spray water and put the fire out and not worry about like, you know, whether we're, we're using too much water. Let's put it that way. It's a very big fire. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next question is from Pedro de Bonilla. Uh, Pedro. Oh, it's Andrew. Uh, uh, my name is Pedro. I'm from Newburgh, New York. And I was wondering um, if you think we can implement a UBI program like the Ginter Rec League did in Africa. Uh, relatedly, what do you think of the effective altruism movement? Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I'm friends with the Give Directly people, and they've now expanded to the US. So we're now trying to give directly right here in the United States. Um, you know, they, they've distributed uh, millions of dollars already um, to people around the country. Um, so you'll be happy to know, Pedro, that Give Directly has spread to the United States of America. And, uh, and that's how we're actually getting money to thousands of people right now. Um, I'm part of this philanthropic effort to do that. Um, I love the effective altruism movement. You know, I like to think of myself as um, a proponent of it. So uh, yeah, I'd like, but you should know Give Directly is here now. Uh, Michael Fay, uh, the CEO and I text somewhat regularly because right now we're trying to get people money. Um, so I, I can talk a little bit about some of the money giving <laughs> efforts. So um, so we've distributed 1.4 million from, from Humanity Forward. We're uh, distributing another 600,000 in a town called Hudson that I think is not that far from you, Pedro. Uh, um, over five years. Uh, and I'm part of something called Project 100 that is giving $100 million away to 100,000 American families in the next 100 days. And that is through Give Directly. So Pedro, you should know that that's something people are working on. Thank you. Um, Andrew, next question is from Daniel Patton. Uh, Daniel, where are you? Uh, hello, Jock. Hello, hello, Mr. Yang. How are you today? Hello, how are you? Um, great. Excuse the lawnmower man behind me here. But um, uh, I'm curious how you think that cryptocurrency could help people. Um, that's my question. I think that cryptocurrency uh, in many ways is illustrating what the future can and, and will look like, uh, where you can, the blockchain has many, many potentially awesome applications. Uh, so I see cryptocurrencies as much like other technologies where I've um, got a bit overhyped, a bit ahead of themselves. Um, you know, there may, might be some real boom and bust cycles, but then the underlying technology ends up becoming very important over time. Uh, one thing I think we are under investing in right now is innovation in currency, uh, where so you have, obviously you have our like cash dollars and then now you have these digital payments. And I think that we're only scratching the surface of what can be possible with uh, different types of currencies. Where if you can imagine, uh, let's say that we have this pandemic and there are tens of millions of jobs lost and we're looking to rejuvenate small businesses because 30% of small businesses are going to close forever. Um, I wish that was a hypothetical, but everything I just said is true and happening right now. So uh, how about we have a currency that just is good at small businesses in a particular community? And then you just say, hey, guess what? Like everyone now has 500 uh, Yang bucks, we'll call them. <laughs> and uh, and they're, they're only good in um, small businesses in uh, this state. And then you're like, all right, well, like what am I going to spend money on? Um, so there, there are things that we can do that um, will be outgrowths of cryptocurrencies that I think we should be doing much, much more of in the days to come. And I think the blockchain is a very, very uh, powerful technology that we should be able to make use of in much bigger and more dramatic ways 
the, the problem with the blockchain right now really is like that um, it's almost too good. And that if you like used it, <laughs> if you used it to its fullest potential, you'd end up displacing uh, many legal accounting, financial services institutions and other institutions. And like those institutions obviously have no interest in uh, like disrupting themselves to that degree. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we have three other questions in the list. Uh, I just want to check on a time perspective. Andrew, do you have a hard stop or can you go? I on? think I'm okay. Uh, Chuck, you know, no one's yelling at me. It should be fine. <laughs> Your assistants will give, a, uh, will give us a hard time after this, but uh, great. In that case, I'll, I'll give everyone a chance to ask their questions here. Uh, the next question is from uh, Andrew Radcliffe. Uh, Andrew? Hi, Andrew. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm from Indianapolis. And my question is, at what moment in your career did you realize that running for president was the right thing to do? Um, the moment my wife said, sure. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, maybe I'm not kidding there. Uh, so I, I ran this nonprofit uh, for six and a half years. And uh, running a nonprofit, great experience. Um, but it, it became clear to me that my organization was not going to be able to operate at a scale to solve the problem that I had imagined us solving. Um, and also that my incentives were not to admit that as the head of that nonprofit. Because, the, because, if, you, because if you're the head of a nonprofit, your incentives are to say, one, we're doing awesome stuff, check it out, which we were, so there's no problem with that. Um, and two, if you give me anything, I'm like super grateful for it. Um, so, you know, if you write a check for $10,000 to Venture of America, I'm like, yeah, thank you for your 10 grand. You can't turn around and say, hey, guess what? I actually need a billion dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, even though you kind of, like I kind of did, or it's like, even if you had it. So one of the interesting things, Andrew, is like I interfaced with folks who were operating at the highest levels of philanthropy, and they were not operating at the level necessary to solve the problem that I imagined. Like, if you're a billionaire, does that mean you're going to give a billion dollars to charity? 99.9% .9 of the cases, no. If you're a billionaire, that means you're operating in checks of like a million bucks, maybe $10 million. Like you're not gonna give all your money away. Like, you know, so, so like, it, it, so just the, the scale that I needed to operate at was just so uh, much bigger than the nonprofit uh, was going to enable. And so I said, okay, if I'm intellectually honest with myself, how do you solve this problem? There is no way to solve this problem except to, um, get a hold of the U.S. government and then rewrite the rules of the economy, and that is an impossibility um, unless you become president. And so I said, okay, what are the rules to become president? Thirty-five years or older, check. You know, U.S. citizen, check. And those are the only rules. And so I was like, okay, I guess I can run for president. Um, so let's do that. Um, so it, it just was like the intellectually honest approach to solving the problem. Um, and I figured that out when Trump won, uh, where I said 2016 Trump wins and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this just happened. Like, this is terrible. I'm sorry if anyone's a Trump supporter, but I was just like, this is a disaster. Um, so, uh, so then I said, well, like, I actually think that the work I've been doing is tied to why Trump won. It's because our economy is pushing millions of manufacturing workers to the sideline and we're going to keep doing that. So uh, it was in early 2017, Andrew, but it was much, much, um, uh, is much, much more an outgrowth of the fact that I've been working in this environment for years and realized I was never going to be able to solve the problems unless I thought a lot bigger. And my wife said yes. So uh, those things together. And stop by writing a book before you launch a presidential campaign. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, you know, I, I will say this is something that's probably obnoxious to say. It's like, so when, when someone runs for president, you're like, oh, this guy's going to write a book. I, I genuinely think that if you're going to run for president, you ought to have written a book because like you need to have some kind of actual reason for running and a vision. Um, and so if you don't have that, then there's something missing in my opinion. So I did write a book. Um, I think I have a copy. Oh yeah, there it is. Oh, this is actually, I'm gonna show this because this book's sort of relevant. Um, so I wrote a book about the automation of jobs in the economy called The War on Normal People um, before I started running. Uh, and one thing I was proud of is that the, the book doesn't mention I'm running for president. <laughs> it's just like a book of facts. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, next question is from uh, Jackson. Uh, Jackson, you want to unmute yourself? All right, sure, Chuck. 
Um, hi, Andrew Yang. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to talk with you today. My name is Jack Detke. Um, I'm in the third quarter as a software engineering major at Kenzie. I'm from Indianapolis. Um, my question is, what do you think the future of America might look like due to the rapid advancements and improvements in technology? And what policies do you think America's government might theoretically try to put out in response to the changes? Well, thanks, Jackson. This is really what my book was about. My book was written before the pandemic. Um, so with the pandemic, we have a whole new set of problems that are much bigger and more urgent. Um, and they're all tied together. So uh, technology is going to speed up and push more and more Americans to the side. But more and more Americans just got ejected from the workforce. Uh, and the number that crushed me was that Right now, only 51.3% of Americans are employed. Um, so you see this unemployment rate, you're like, oh, 15%, like, oh, that's terrible. Like, oh, it can get up to 20% in the Great Depression, blah, blah, blah. That stuff understates it. When you look at the actual employed to population ratio, it's 51.3%, the lowest in recorded American history. So that's problem number one. It's like, oh my gosh, we've got tens of millions of Americans who are either out of the workforce or just hanging on. Um, and so what do you do to try and change that? And then you need to do everything you can. Put money into their hands so that they can uh, both take care of themselves and their families, but also participate in the local economy, shore up nonprofits, state governments, hospitals, schools, small businesses, so they don't shed more jobs and maybe even hire a few people. Uh, and then the government should be rebuilding the country in ways big and small that end up spurring job growth in any way possible. Um, so that would be infrastructure, hiring healthcare workers, hiring 5G installers, um, also supporting local organizations who wanna hire for anything under the sun, a massive mental health initiative that would require a lot of new jobs if you did it right. Um, there are all these things we should do, Jackson, because we're facing great depression level uh, job displacement and job loss right now. And a study just came out that said 42% of the, the 33 million jobs we've lost um, will never come back. Um, so if, if they're right about that, I think they're, I've, I'm sure they're right. Let's call it half. Um, so if you lose 17 million jobs for good, that's an epic catastrophe. Like that's in excess of anything we've seen. And that's where we are right now. Uh, you know, like the desperation is just beginning. Um, it's, it's terrible. Like, like we need to invest trillions of dollars trying to jumpstart us out of this, uh, this catastrophe. It's like, uh, the, there was an economist who said like, this economy is not gonna be a rocket ship. It's gonna be like a truck stuck in the mud. Um, and that's right. What we have to do is we have to try and get boards under the wheels so that the truck can like start to move out of the ditch. Um, <clears throat> so like it or not, the government is going to be the main plank uh, like a uh, source of like the planks to help the, the truck get out of the ditch. Um, and we should spare no expense. Very, very big moves. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, second last question for the day is uh, from Chris Cogger, who is a Kenzie instructor. Chris, over to you. Hey, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'm a senior instructor here at Kenzie and the head of the coaching program, currently residing out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, my question for you is, how do you envision us tackling the impending threat of mon monopolies? Companies like Disney and Qualcomm are growing at incredible rates. These large holding companies designed to scale and distribute control and having a larger ability to, to manipulate the culture of a, of a society. How can we prepare for this upcoming world where Google Ads has a complete control over the online advertising industry? This is such a great question, Chris. Uh, consolidation in our biggest industries has been a massive problem. The fact that you use Disney is funny because I'm a parent and it, is, it does seem like Disney owns all the good content. Um, but, but that's like a, like a marginal concern, believe it or not, relative like to the, uh, the FANG group of uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Um, like that crew, I actually, I'll even put Netflix out of that category because like, you know, who cares? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's really, it's really the other ones. Um, and uh, Facebook, Amazon, Google, uh, they have quasi monopolies now in their spaces. Um, and Apple and, and 
the problem is that there are so many problems with it, but one problem is that um, if you're a startup today in one of those spaces, you don't even pretend you're going to somehow beat uh, those companies. You just say, hey, I'm going to become big enough where they buy me for like, you know, enough money where we're all rich. And then whatever they do with my offering, who knows, who cares? Like the, the, those companies buy things for the talent and then they just kill the offering. Um, they sometimes buy things just to sweep a competitive threat away. Uh, so th these companies are unfathomably big, powerful and wealthy. Uh, and like th the question is, what do you do about it? Now, some politicians would say, oh, we need to break them up. Um, and uh, I think that in some cases, we should have them divest parts of their businesses. Um, but generally speaking, break them up is not a winning solution for some of these spaces. Like, can you imagine if I said, hey, guess what? Um, we all can't use Facebook anymore. Uh, so 30% of us are gonna use Facebook and then 30% of us are gonna use some other government version. And then 40% uh, of us are gonna use like this other competitor that we came up with. It's like, you'd be like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> it's like the entire purpose of this thing is so I can just like get to anybody. Um, so like, so some of these things like just don't make any sense. If you're saying like, oh, I'm gonna break it up. Um, but you need really strict rules around acquisitions. You need really strict rules around their practices when it comes to influencing, um, let's call it our democracy I, and, uh, and um, our mental health, which many of these organizations do, ha do affect um, in very significant ways. Um, and, and so it, to me, the break them up thing is like a little bit primitive it's like you have to identify what the specific problems you're concerned about are, and then you have to dig deep um, and then regulate them, uh, you know, in a way that uh, that actually serves the public interest. Um, so it's a really, really important problem. It's very much underestimated um, how much consolidation has already occurred and the effect it's having. I like I made light of the Disney thing, but like it is true that. Um, there's almost like this monoculture of content um, in a particular way coming um, for like certain types of programming. Um, I, I feel like just the word content has sort of like diminished art. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, like you produce some content. That's great. Like may, may it eat up 10 minutes of my life and then I will move on. <laughs> like, like, like the whole thing. It's like, oh, the numbers said this art sucked. <laughs> like, or, or whatever. No, I mean, it's like, like some of the stuff, like it was the stuff of humanity and now it's just getting reduced uh, to, you know, a set of numbers. Um, so yeah, Chris, I'm concerned. Like we, we need to get into the guts and, and start um, regulating in a much more significant way without just saying we're going to break you up. Because in some cases, some cases we should have them uh, like break off certain parts of themselves. Thank you. I know my daughters would be happy to leave Facebook and go to TikTok. Uh, different generation. <laughs> uh, no, sure, TikTok. For whom, uh, the, for people who find Instagram too intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there are a lot of questions coming from Slack, uh, from the Q&A, uh, but I, uh, to be respectful of Andrew's time, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the last question, uh, and it's from Manuel Velasco. Manuel, are you around? Yes, sir. I finally made it here. <laughs> um, so yeah, my question was uh, in political, in the plot, in the political, was there another political party that may have interested you in joining? Thanks, Manuel. Um, you know, it's like I, I uh, find myself aligned with libertarians on, on some fronts. Um, uh, I ruled out running in a, a third party um, immediately, though, because I think that anyone running uh, just increases the odds of Trump winning. Um, so I, I never looked at it in any real way. Um, but like I found myself, uh, you know, despite the fact that, you know, like right now we're in like the opposite of a libertarian um, environment where it's like clearly the government's going to be the center of the universe. Um, like, and like saying, like, oh, like obviously I think putting money into people's hands is like good for people. Um, and makes people stronger and also gives us freedom to do what we want and freedom not to starve. <laughs> like, the freedom not to starve. Um, so 
you know, like I find myself aligned with the Green Party too on many things, like in climate change and other things. So it, it's it's funny. It's like I, I like I, I I did find myself sympathetic to different um, uh, different independent parties, um, but the mechanics of American elections make that very very uh, unfeasible, um, and that's something that I would uh, say you know, we should change. Um, it's one reason why I'm so passionate about democracy reform and ranked choice voting, because if you have this duopoly, people feel like they don't have a choice. Uh, and then the parties be like, well, I don't need to worry about it because what are you gonna do, vote for the other people? Um, and so like you wind up with like a much less dynamic democracy, um, like a much lower voice for individuals. Um, and so if, if you can change the system, this is one of those things where the mechanics of the system actually profoundly influence our government, our democracy, and the result. Like you think, oh, ranked choice voting, whatever. It's like, if you had ranked choice voting, Trump probably doesn't win. You have many more independent candidates. Uh, you know, the whole thing changes. Uh, so I'm really, really passionate about the process in part because of this question, um, Manuel. Now, let me say like, you know, I'm supporting Joe, like the rest of it, like I'm, I'm down, um, but I would love to have a more dynamic system that reflects the will of the people to a much higher degree than we currently have. With that, um, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. Everyone give Andrew a warm Kenzie. Zoom, uh, thank you, applause. Uh, thank you for all the work that you've done for the country uh, and you know, to, like I said, to cover our time to, to talk to our students. Um, and um, sometimes we ask our speakers to nominate other people they would like to come guest lecture. You seem to know everyone who's famous now in the country uh, and we appreciate any recommendation? Well, I'll, I'll try to get you someone fun, Chuck. Sure. I mean, I guess I enjoyed the heck out of this and I can tell them, hey, it's a very, very enjoyable experience. Great questions, great student body, great instructors. Uh, and to answer a question I did not answer before, I actually, I do intend to run uh, for office again. So, you know, you, you should see me again in, in some race or another. Um, nice. We, rooting for it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And uh, yeah, like, Congrats on the work you're doing, Ashley, with your kids and, uh, and uh, otherwise. Um, and thank you all. This was a lot of fun uh, and really grateful to Kenzie for the work you're doing every day. So keep it up. Let's make people stronger and more equipped for the future. Thank you, Andrew. Say hi to Adeline. Take care. I will. Say hi to the family. Talk. Bye, everyone. Stay bye. safe thank out you. there. Bye, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah. See you, Andrew. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Bye, Amanda. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew.